Welcome to Series 2 of Bass Talk with Hagen and Hayes. Today's subject is American music for the double bass, and I'm really looking forward to finding out much more about the American double bass. How are you, Susan? I'm well, David. How are you doing? Very well, thanks. I'm looking forward to hearing all your about all your knowledge of American bass composers and composers writing for the bass. <laughs> and I have a feeling you'll know as much, if not more, than I do. <laughs> But I think that we're we're really living in a time where we've talked about this before. People are writing for this instrument. Finally, you know, Beethoven didn't. Brahms really didn't. I mean, they had orchestral parts. But as far as solo music and chamber music and things like that, I think we're really living in a golden age. Um, and here in America, I mean, there's so many different people on different scales. I and mean, we've got Mm. Elliot Carter, who I don't know how how well do you know him in Europe? Yeah, he's he's really well known. Yeah, and he's written several solo bass pieces. I taught one of them to several of my students called Figments, and it's hard, but it's good. It's um the type of music. It's you're not going to really walk away from it singing a melody, which mm. personally I love to be able to walk away singing something. Um, but he's definitely written and, and he's was very linked in with Boston when mm. James Levine was conducting the Boston Symphony. Um, they had a good friendship musically speaking and he did a lot of commissions and premieres. And I remember one day um, Carter's assistant came backstage and just sort of stood where all the bass player, I was there, stood where all the bass players were congregating, usually eating cookies. and. Um, he just started handing out this piece of music and said, Elliot just wrote this and he's wondering if any of you would want to play it. And then he walked away and we all got an original copy of this piece figment. And it's interesting. It's, it's cool. And, um, it was really fun to teach it. I've mm -hmm. never performed it, but I've taught it. So I know it well. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know how far across the country or the world that piece has gotten. Um, it, it, I think it's quite popular. It, it's, it's, yeah. um, it, I think it's quite well known because it's by Elliot Carter because he lived so long. Yes. There was a resurgence of interest in him, him and his music. I, right. I think it did get to Asia Hundred or yes, we played a concert before. where they brought this huge cake out on stage. Um, they said a hundred and mm -hmm. happy birthday, and I was so excited because my first thought was cake, um, <laughs> but unfortunately, it wasn't a real cake. <laughs> I was so upset, but they had cake backstage, but it wasn't that it was just beautiful. It was decorated with like a keyboard wrapped around the outside of it and music notes. And, oh, it was absolutely stunning. And I thought that cake looks delicious, but I think I would have been eating cardboard. <laughs> <laughs> that was an embarrassing moment because I walked backstage and I said to everybody, did you see that cake? Oh, I can't wait to dig into that thing. And they said, Susan, it's fake. <laughs> <laughs> It but it feels weird. like there's a, a real, it's a real golden age. And it, I do think that the Americans are leading the uh, way forward because I, yeah, I'm astounded by how many people are writing for the bass, not just bass players, but right. also mainstream composers. And I, I think it's, it's showing everybody else what's possible. It, it really yeah. is um, possible to interest composers who wouldn't normally write for the bass. I, I, before he died, I was in contact with uh, Gunter Schuller. Mm -hmm. um, and he was a lovely chap. He, we were on first name terms, which was so nice. I never yeah. met him. But I, I knew of him because he'd written a bass quartet. Um, I think in, I think he was 22 at the time. Um, so it's, it's quite an early early piece. But he, he'd written it with different tunings for each bass player. Yes. And you have to retune sometimes between that's movements. Right. That's right. <laughs> Which I is a little tricky because it knocks the bass out of tune. Yeah. But at the time it was called unplayable. Um, mm. And nowadays, you know, um, university students and conservatory mm. students are playing it. It's amazing yep. how standards have changed. But I asked him about writing a second bass concerto. And at the time he was 88. Mm. And he liked the symmetry of 22 and 88. Oh, sure. And he was interested. He was interested. But I think he already had maybe too many commissions. Um, so we didn't quite get to that point. And then he died, sadly. Um, right, right. But I thought, wouldn't that have been fantastic to have had two quartets from somebody yes. like Miller? Oh, my gosh, yes. And that 
that quartet I actually played because at Tanglewood, the summer home of the Boston mm. Symphony, um, I was a fellowship student for two summers and I think it was the first summer I was there. We every year they would choose four players to do the quartet and right. Gunther was in the audience. And I'll wow. tell you when we were we had only a week to put it together, which is actually quite a bit of time when you think about it. But yes. when you're a kid you think I have to have this learned in a week. Yeah. Um and it was so much fun and we worked on it with um Todd Sieber, who's a bass player in the symphony. Mm. And we had the hardest time finding a recording at that point in time. This was like 1999. It just, it, I mean, we didn't have you know, iTunes and mm. Amazon playlists and Spotify and all that stuff. Um, and we found a recording that was quite dreadful. It really was not helpful at all. So we all listened to it once and said, ooh, okay, we're better off just practicing. But when we played it, Seiji Ozawa was in the audience and Gunther was in the audience and Gunther came running backstage. And I remember that our coach had said to us, no, Gunther is very picky. If he's here, he might not like it. It's just, he's mm. very like, this is my music. It needs to be played just mm. so. And he said to us that it was the best performance to that point that he had ever heard of it. And That's we, fantastic. we were actually relieved. A couple days later, we were overjoyed, but at first we were just relieved, <laughs> but it's a really, really cool piece. Mm. And it's the type of difficult music that's worth every second of practice time it's mm. rewarding and there's, you know there's some music that's hard and then you learn it and you think that was worthless it was just mm. wasted time i didn't like the piece this just was it was fulfilling it was a really nice piece to learn um there's well, he, a, he was really nice he was very friendly in the emails yeah and I, I can't even remember now how I made contact with him. It must have been through somebody else who was someone who knew him. But I thought he was the most lovely chap and we got on so well. And he was, he was such a, um, a nice person to be in contact with. It was, it, it's like yeah. being um, in contact with somebody from the past, even though right. he's still alive. Because he, right. he was 88, 80, 89, I think, when he died. But mm -hmm. he, was, he was and he's still enthusiastic and still passionate and, yeah. um, and still interested. And I thought that was really... Really nice. He was, I think he composed almost until till he died. He did. He did. Mm. He was very active. He was even conducting. Um, I played a performance of Pulcinella, and I was not the principal bass player. I was playing the accompaniment. And mm. he was very specific with his dynamics. He had in his mind, mezzo forte is this sort of decibel level yes. and mezzo piano is this other one and if you were just a skosh off he would stop the rehearsal and um, <laughs> he was very passionate so he would kind of yell it wasn't mean but it was like no 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 that's not it that's too loud and then you would take like just one percent off the volume and he's like that's it um <laughs> he had a very clear concept in his mind of what he wanted and he could explain it and get it from the players so that was great um and i had friends who played in the ragtime ragtime band that he had at new england conservatory in the 70s and 80s um so it's you know it's he was just a great musician and and not afraid to write for the bass i remember when i was in college i would ask people to write pieces for me mm -hmm. or for me and my sister who's a violinist and you know sometimes that would make them slightly more interested if it wasn't just for bass mm -hmm. um but now it, they would always sort of like wrinkle their nose and say eh, no i don't think so now <laughs> i ask people and they're enthusiastic and mm -hmm. almost everyone that hasn't already written a piece for bass they'll say i love the bass it sounds so beautiful and I've always wanted to write something for it. I'd be delighted to. And I'm always surprised that that's the answer because 20 years ago, that was not the answer. Um, uh, so and it's nice that we right. also have player composers. Yes. Uh, and that helps because straight away they know what works and what doesn't. Yes. yes. And I, th I think they've, they've pushed the, the repertoire forward. So who, who have you commissioned and, and what have you played from American composers? <laughs> I've commissioned a a couple of pieces um i'm not going to give their names because i didn't perform them they were unplayable um but they, they were play. not bass players but they were people that kind of thought they knew um but i also commissioned a piece by a trumpeter in the boston symphony he wrote some really great pieces that we played with the boston pops his name is mike martin and i haven't performed it yet but i will be performing it eventually because it's a really um exciting and energetic and very cool piece um 
that he actually calls the tightrope, which is hilarious because I have a warm up in my warm up book called the tightrope, and he didn't know. But when I told him, he just looked at me, and he's a really funny guy. A deadpan, he said, "Well, that makes sense because I know how to play all your warm ups," which of course he doesn't. But <laughs> um, that's a really cool piece. Um, I have a friend who has written music for a trio that I play in violin, cello, and bass. And I said, would you ever write a solo piece for me? And he did and it called Early Morning Tram. And right. it's very like train sounding, which is yeah. super cool, um, which is a lot of fun. Um, and of course, Cal, Calic Waddle, he has <laughs> written tons of stuff um, for, for you, for me, for us. Uh, we're actually going to perform something of his in April together. Um, he's down in Austin and he's very, a very enthusiastic and willing composer, which is something I love. You ask somebody to write a piece for you and not only are they happy, but they just like go crank it out and do it. And which is very fun. Um, there's a woman in Boston named Marty Epstein and she has like a five year waiting list of commissions. She's just incredibly sought after. Yeah. Um, but she has put me on her list and she's writing something for me when, you know, when my name comes up in the queue. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very excited. Her, her music is always quite difficult, but really like to learn, but mm. for the listener, it's very accessible and, and great to listen to, um, which makes it rewarding. Mm. So, now you've the, had a lot of contact with American composers. Yes, I think the first uh, American composer I came across was Frank Proto. Mm -hmm. um, Frank is is sort of the, the doyen of American composers, yes. and what I like about Frank is he's completely untaught, self-taught as a composer, and because he he plays so much music in so many different styles, yes. his music. Um, embraces all these different styles and it's really exciting to play exciting to teach exciting yeah. as an audience member and I, I think he's written some fantastic music i think his music will really survive a lot I of think it will mm. the sonata the the carmen fantasy that he wrote i actually like that better than many of the violin carmen mm. fantasies that exist um and boy, they're exciting to teach. They're exciting to play. And when mm. my students are learning that, oh, they just get really, really thrilled by music. And I think you're right because he plays jazz. He played classical. He really has, he's so versatile and it finds its way into his music. It, it has a, a vibrancy about yeah. it. And it's, it's quite free flowing, all of it. Um, and I'm not sure he writes in styles. He just, just writes and it works. I think that's yeah. a nice thing. The common fantasy is, is an absolute classic, a 21st century classic. Yes. I think it's unbelievable. I, I was in correspondence with him about the 1963 Sonata. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he was at Juilliard at the time, but he's also working outside. And it's, I think he said he was at the Catskill Mountains at the holiday places. Yep. You know, one night he'd be doing jazz and an hour later he'd be in a, in a mariachi band. And then two hours <laughs> later he'd be at Klezma and, and all these things. That's and all great. these things, I think, have inspired his his writing. And I think he got to his final year, and his teacher, David Walter, had said, right, OK, we'll do a recital for your final year. So he went to see whoever he had to see. And they said, oh, double bass, you, you, you don't need to do a recital. Uh -huh. And David Walter said, no, but he wants to. Oh, you really don't. You really don't. And <laughs> David had to insist. Um, oh gosh. Otherwise, Frank wouldn't have got a recital. And then... They're putting a program together. And Frank said he couldn't find any modern music that he liked. Sure. So David said, well, why don't you write something? And that's how Sonata 1963 came about. Wow. Wrote it for his own recital. Isn't that wow. amazing? Wow, that's brilliant. What a good solution. <laughs> Isn't it? But it's it's as lively and accessible today. I, I, yes. I've been teaching it the last few weeks. And mm -hmm. it just hasn't aged at all. It's absolutely fantastic music. Yeah, it's yeah. Really, it's it's, um, yeah. There's a there's a, it's, it's quite luminous, and it it's a combination, I think, of all the different styles. Yeah, which is the uh, reason it's successful. It 
that piece <laughs> I didn't know about for a very long time. And mm. uh, my best friend in college, Michiko Suzuku, she was from Tokyo. And when she was done with school, she, she moved back home to Tokyo and she made a CD and she sent it to me and Sonata 1963 was on it. And I thought, I don't, I don't know this piece. I put the CD mm. on and I was just mind blown partially because Michiko herself was an incredibly highly trained pianist who had gone mm. to the Toho school and decided she wanted to be a conductor. Mm. So she found Seiji Ozawa and she said to Seiji, I would like to be a conductor. What do I do? And he said, Oh, you've got to learn an instrument that's in the orchestra. You can't just be a pianist. So she decided to become a double bass player. She was very entrenched in, you know, classical music mm -hmm. and she sent me this cd and the opening of it, well, the whole piece just has this jazzy feel to it and mm -hmm. i was so impressed at her versatility because i didn't know she had it in her um just because i'd never heard her play anything jazzy before and at that moment i was like oh i have to play this piece this is really fun um and that you know that was my introduction to the piece and she was laughing she said how do you not know that <laughs> and i said i don't know but you do and you're over in Tokyo and you learned it and it was good but that's proto you know he's so well known I think that his music travels around the world which is great and the nice thing about the first movement is um he just uses one chord the accompaniment just um yes. wave of movement we say you say mm -hmm. eighth movement and then the next measure will be a different chord and it inspired me to write a piece just using two chords Mm -hmm. um, and I, 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 a piece called uh, Beneath the Stars, yes. and I chose two sort of jazz chords, which they never really resolved. Right. You had one which would, felt as though it needed to resolve to something, but then it didn't. There was a tension in the next chord, mm -hmm. returning to the first chord. And I used it. And then I just used lots of different rhythmic variation to hide the fact I was only using two chords. Yep. And it's amazing how many people don't realise it only uses two chords, apart from the very last D major ending, where suddenly yeah. there's a resolution. But that, that was because of Frank. I was so impressed. I wondered about that because I've taught that piece to several students and I yeah. accompany them and they're playing it. And only one of them caught the fact that it was really two chords. Uh, the other student's like, wow, how can you play that? And I'm like, I'm not going to tell you my secret. And one other kid said, hmm you're really only playing two chords until the end, aren't you? I said, yeah, but you don't have to tell anyone. <laughs> exactly. But exactly. I wondered if it was from Frank's piece. It was. I'd been teaching that one, and I just thought it was, it was such a cool thing to do. And as yeah. a composer, it's a nice challenge. Right. Just two chords and see how you can hide the fact that you're right. only using two chords. Yeah, yeah. So Frank now, is there... a fantastic yeah. piece. Oh, lots of great music. And then there are some others. Um, do you know the John Harbison concerto for, for double bass? I think he mm. calls it. Contra that was an amazing commission. Um, yes. Because I think, wasn't it lots of uh, principal bass? A, yeah, it was a whole symposium yes, of people. Five yeah, or so six it was different. a big commission. And yeah. it was interesting because he had to write, I think, the piece for three different variations. The bass part had to work in orchestral tuning, solo tuning, and for bass tuning fifths. Yes. The yes, man deserves a, Quarrington. deserves a medal for yes. trying to write one piece that would tick all those boxes. That's unbelievable. I have a secret about that piece. So I was... I was playing at Emanuel Music, which is a church in Boston that oh. every weekend does a Bach cantata. Yes. And he was, he was, you know, on the board of directors and an assistant conductor. He was there all the time. He would conduct sometimes. And um, we knew each other quite well. And, and he would come to a lot of concerts that I was playing. And he said to me one day, he said, Susan, I've been commissioned to write a concerto and I don't know what to do. Your tuning is completely freaking me out. <laughs> and I said, okay, so let's talk about it. So we talked about it and um, I, I actually gave him a little bit of advice and I said, you know, write it first and then see how it will lie on the instrument. I said, you've got a lot of variables that you have to deal with. I said, but don't modify what's coming into your head until you've put it on paper because mm. it just might work. Mm. Um, 
And so we, he had all the performances I went to hear. I actually, Ed Barker played it w with the Boston Symphony because he was one of the people in the symposium that commissioned it. And I, I turned, he did a, like a, a dry run through with piano before, mm -hmm. a couple of weeks before he did it with the Boston Symphony. And I was the page turner for the pianist, which was like so high pressure scary. <laughs> So I was like, oh God, I could single-handedly take this performance down. Um, but so I did that and, I, and then I went to like some of the rehearsals and the performances that Ed mm -hmm. played and he played it with another orchestra in Boston as well. Um, and after the, the whole thing was over, John called me and he said, you know, I'd really like you to perform this because mm -hmm. I know you'll play it exactly the way I envisioned it. I haven't gotten that from any of the other performances yet. And I said, I heard the performance in Boston. It was pretty dang good. He said it was, but you know, I never, I haven't performed it. Um, but mm. I know it's, it's, it was one that he was hoping, <laughs> hoping yep. I would. He said, I will call orchestras on your behalf and, and see. Um, but at that point I wasn't doing any mm. solo playing and I was sort of, mm, we'll see, maybe, maybe not, not sure. But, um, he's very very popular in boston because he's mm -hmm. he's based here um but it, that is it's a really fun and interesting piece it mm -hmm. really is i think it made a big splash i think that the enthusiasm about it has died down at this point because it's been a little while but i think that if it were were performed again it, people would be very excited about it again that's um, amazing really neat. yeah now you've mm -hmm. commissioned people like eric funk and john kennedy and mm -hmm. others like that tell tell me a little bit about them and how you met them and reached out to them and all eric uh contacted me i, I think we, we must have uh, maybe it was on facebook or on the internet we somehow made contact mm -hmm. um and i was teaching in london at the time and he was he was going i think to one of the baltic states to record some of his music and he's coming via London. So we, we met up and we spent hours and hours just talking. We, we became friends instantly. Oh, how nice. Um, he wrote a concerto for me and other pieces. And he came over to Bass Fest. He was a featured composer. Um, and I'm just starting to, to republish all his music. And he's fantastic because he's completely, he understands the bass. And anything that doesn't quite work, he's really happy for me to change it, to mm -hmm. make it work. He's, he's very, very open to... To the player having some input he's and he writes great music he's, he's really i think a really great composer very underrated composer yeah. um but the bass music is lovely i'm, I'm playing a piece written for our kuzovitsky project yes um and it, it's quite high and I, I said to him it will actually work an octave lower you know and the octave lower is beautiful it's just in this nice rich um, sonorous register without being right at the the top of the bass yeah um, yeah and it, it's really beautiful I, I really love his music so he eric i've been friends with for for many years and i just had an email this week and i, I was said about new projects i was doing um because of anniversaries this year of oh, right. and puccini and he, yes. he said count me in for both i'm, I'm happy great. Yeah, isn't that nice oh that's great i love his music and i think he might be uh, trying to come out to Boston when you're here in April. Wow, that'd be too. fantastic. Yes, yeah. So, yes. so he, and he got Sarah and I out to Montana. We, I did the premiere of his concerto with the beautiful little uh, string orchestra, the Rockies, which oh, was that's nice. nice. So that was that was good. So we've we've been friends for for goodness twenty five, nearly thirty years, maybe. Wow. Oh, that's great. Nice music. Armand Russell. Um, I don't know how I contacted Armand Russell. Mm -hmm. Um. Maybe he contacted me. I don't know, but we somehow made contact, and and then I started publishing all his music. And again, he was fantastic. You know, I just say, Armand, do you fancy writing me a new piece? And I I tell him what it was and how many minutes, and and he just yeah. write it. He, he oh, just he loved composing, and he would always write music which was accessible. Um, yes. and so that, that was not nice. difference. <laughs> he does, and Bert Turetsky. Bert is a great friend of mine. He, yes. he, I remember he, I think he wrote to me, this is when I first started out, and he put, Dear Mr. Hayes. Aww. And then Bert, he's one of my heroes. And yeah. I couldn't believe that this, this hero is calling me Mr. Hayes. Right. So strange. But we've been friends for, uh, again, he came to Bass Fest in, I think, 2004. So we've been friends for, I don't know, 25, 30 years. And I published quite a lot of his, his bass music. And I think one of the final pieces he wrote was three small pieces for me uh for oh. the bass which yes. was really nice the first movement is lots of baroque snippets mm -hmm. of 
I've performed this one. Yeah, it's nice. The second movement is all in harmonics. Yes. And the third movement is 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 Bert. Um, I think you have to hit chopsticks. Different... That's right. Yes. And I've I've always said to many audiences, I'm not sure you're ready for this, but I'm going to give it a go. <laughs> It's really, it's just another aspect of what the bass can do. If people love it. They respond really well. I actually had to buy a set of chopsticks because I don't, <laughs> I don't, embarrassingly don't have chopsticks in my house. So I bought a set of three pairs mm. and they're like hand painted and really pretty, of yeah. course. Um, mm. Nice colors because I figure if I'm going to use the chopstick, if it's wood colored, you mm. won't see it against yeah. the base. So if it's, you know, blue or purple or something that uh, there's a yellow pair too, mm. and it, it's just more visible for the audience. And I think that's maybe a good thing. <laughs> I never know, but I think it is. Yeah. Um, one Bert, other person. Uh, mm. He writes nice music and he's, his whole life has been in contemporary music. So some of his music is a bit yes. modern. Um, but it also he was also a jazz player before he became right. uh, classical. So a lot of his... his so jazzy bass music is really popular and yes. that does really well so i've published quite a lot of Burt stuff there's a, a little bit more still to to republish and That's and good. then i love his mary music Ray. i think mary is a, a flautist she and is I, I don't know how we became friends but she's, she's a, so a, sweet she's the most lovely lady and and yeah. really fantastic composer and often she writes everything is, is really quite short and quite succinct mm. Mm -hmm, and again, mm -hmm. she's fantastic because I'll now say, Mary, I think it's a tone too low or Mary should go up a fifth or do you mind if I change this? And she's so lovely. She's like, she'll just, just do whatever you like because as a yeah. bass player, I can see what the possibilities are. And yeah. uh, so hopefully the, the finished product is fantastic composer with a bit of editing from my yeah. part. Right. But, but Mary, Mary's been so supportive. She's really She lovely. is so kind. And also she's a part of the Cherokee community and she's helping to keep mm. the language alive of the Cherokees, yes. which mm. uh, is really in this country, that is a very important project because mm. we've taken so much from the natives. Mm. And it's really interesting. She'll post things on, on Facebook a lot and I'm just in awe of it. Mm. But her music is, like you said, it's succinct, but it's always so beautiful. It leaves me wanting more, which I think is a good thing, you yes. know? She which really is, is a miniaturist, and it's, but everything she writes is exquisite. It, it it's, is. It's almost like they're just, just the right number of notes. It's really perfect. And it, yeah. it just says what she wants it to say. I think it's lovely music. It's, and I, really I agree wholeheartedly. I always feel like it's the perfect sized cupcake, you know, it's just, <laughs> You, you might want more, but you know that that was enough. Exactly. That's great. And in Florida, there's another, which is Lloyd Goldstein. And mm -hmm. he he does something which I really think is super special, um, where he goes into the cancer centers and plays for mm -hmm. the patients. And mm -hmm. that I know brings peace and joy and, and some healing mm -hmm. to the people, the patients and, and their visitors. Um, mm -hmm. And he writes a lot of, soulful music and then some really upbeat music i've played a lot of his and i find him to be quite generous he has sent me previews of some of his music before it's yeah. published so that i can play it um and it definitely to me has like it has a very american sound which mm -hmm. i think is cool because you know he's american <laughs> so it, it just has that flair to it um and my husband tends to dance during a lot of these pieces. I shouldn't be telling anyone this, but I just did. Um, it, but his his music is very, very fun. And every now and then it makes me think, should I be playing for patients? Like, it's just, it's an inspiring thing. Um, really special and I think important. My mom, my mom has a, her best friend would bring these beautifully super groomed, very clean dogs, um, to hospitals to visit yes. patients. Yeah. And I think anything we can do to to comfort mm -hmm. the ill, you know, it's it's a really nice thing. I met Lloyd in Prague in 2016. Right. We, I think we had really early morning. We just had coffee together and he was such mm -hmm. a lovely man and writes yeah. really lovely music. I really yes. enjoy his music. And you're right, it is almost completely American. It's yeah. whatever American is. I right. think Lloyd encompasses that. He's, he's got a way of just creating well, it's, it's sort of aaron copeland this yes it? yes there's something to about me, it which is couldn't really be from any other uh, any other country right 
to me, American music, I mean, if I know we're talking about bass players and gosh, I wish he'd written something for just us. Um, but if you say American music, I think Copeland. Mm. It just, to me, it just paints the landscape and, you know, all of that. It's just, it's beautiful. And, and I think Lloyd really encompasses that very well. I agree um, completely. Yeah. yeah. And then two yeah. others we must talk about, yes. Mike and Lord Montgomery. Oh, how can we not from. talk about them? Exactly. They're two super enthusiastic and generous people. They really, they they write music for us all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to be playing one of, well, Jason, I think, is going to play Mike's piece, but we're going to be playing one of Lord's pieces, that a duet she wrote for us. I April. think I'm, I think you're playing her Kuzovitsky piece. I'm as well. playing her solo piece. Yes. Yeah, and then she's written this nice Danzon, Danzon yeah. number two, this Cuban. Um, and it has yeah. that great Cuban flair to it. Yes, it's fantastic. It's, piece for I two love bases. that. Bring two basses. We'll be doing it with two basses and piano to start with, yes. so we yes. uh, get a string orchestra. Uh, but yes. Yes, great music. And I think they're coming to to Boston. They are. Where Sarah and I are coming, so it'd be so nice yes. to all meet up together we should meet do a podcast with all our composers. i think we should i think that would be great yeah it? yeah yeah and they're great because they're down in arkansas mm. um and they've invited me to come down and and play some of their music and i guess mike has a testori bass and lord said leave your bass at home come play mike's <laughs> But they're they're a great couple because they're both very kind and always willing to to write music and I don't think they ever say no to it. You know, it's it's great and that enthusiasm is important. Yeah, and but I think we all share the same enthusiasm. I think that's the nice yes. thing about yes. this. And Mike and Lord are, are exactly like that. I I love working with them and they're they're so generous with their time and talent and and and. Yep it's really nice it's so I've, I've really enjoyed getting to know so many american composers it's it's amazing because 20 years ago i didn't know many that wrote for the bass here in america and now i feel like i'm sure we've forgotten dozens of people and mm. we'll have to do a second follow-up to this <laughs> or something but you know it's it's as you say we're in a golden age and we're just we're so lucky i really feel grateful to that mm. um we are so we'll maybe revisit but maybe we'll talk about europeans at some point too and and british composers god knows there's a lot of them and i know one right here <laughs> but this is this is a fun topic and thank you everybody for listening to season two of bass talk with hagen and hayes like and subscribe on our channel we'd like to thank our sponsors leatherwood rosin who has such a great line of of new bass rosins um so check them out at leather leatherwoodrosin.com.au or you can see it on on our website there's a link there and also to gracegallery.net and everybody i hope you all stay well and we look forward to talking next time take care bye